sorrow, the wind dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given me. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Oh, when death was arrested and my life began. Yeah. Oh, your grace. So stand up together this morning as we continue in our worship. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost 
but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I Welcome to the church at 1548 Heights. We are glad you're here. My name is Angela Soper, and I'm a covenant member here. I don't know about y'all, but I was really eager to come to worship today and be in the house of God. It's been a hard week. Uh, welcome guests. We're so glad you're here and visitors and guests online. For those of you who are here, would you please fill out a communications card? or a connections card. The reason why we have this is, first of all, we want to know you're here, but more than anything, we're a praying church, and on Wednesday nights, we get together, and, and those of us who aren't able to get together on Wednesday nights pray for these requests as well, but on Wednesday nights, we pray specifically for all of the prayers that are written on these cards, and we've had some amazing answers to these prayers, and we've had times where we've just waited, and that's what we do, we wait on the Lord. So please fill this out, and you can put it in the back on your way out or um, at the collection plate. Welcome. Let's continue to worship. Our children at this time, up to the ages of 10, are dismissed to go back to our children's church um, this morning. Um, this morning, as we continue in worship, um, uh, this morning is going to be a little bit different as um, this week has been um, a difficult week for a lot of people including teachers and schools, and uh, Matt kind of um, thought it might be a good thing for me to speak as a teacher 
Um, and I kind of was struggling to find out what to even say, how to find the right words. And this morning, I am literally surrounded by other teachers. Um, uh, this is Gina Moore right here, my theater teacher, my father, who has been my teacher, my brother, who is a teacher, my other brother who teaches. And um, so I feel very um, supportive in this moment. But uh, we get to this point at the end of the year where students and teachers kind of start to get annoyed with each other. And students are ready to be uh, have their break. And teachers are ready to have their break. And the events of this re week kind of like put that mindset totally off. Um, in, a, in a time of frustration where you can get overwhelmed with your kids and you're so ready for the summer, you instead find yourself cherishing and embracing every moment, every moment of disobedience, every moment of struggle, every moment of joy. I find myself this week just crying at the simplest things, a student reading to me, a student crying over the fact that CMK make the same sound and she was so frustrated. Um, um, and it, this, this week, uh, there's nothing to do but just to cherish those moments. And um, in this time where we are coming here, probably in a lot of different emotional states, um, as we sing these songs and as we worship, I just invite you to embrace those emotions. In this place, in this house, you are safe. And this is where you can express and feel um, those frustrations, that anger, that sadness, um, and you have people here to support you in that. And so as we continue in worship, um, just whatever posture of worship is comfortable to you this morning, um, please enter into that. Yeah. 
We're going to read this um, prayer together this morning. Um, I will read the words in white, and if you will respond with the text that appears in yellow. We offer ourselves to you, O God, our creator. We offer our hands. Use healing touch to comfort sisters, brothers, and children who are afraid. We offer our eyes and ears. May we see and hear the signs and stories of violence so that all may have someone with them in their pain and confusion. We offer our hearts and our tears as their hurt and sorrow echo within us. May we be healed as we embrace each other. We offer our anger. May make it a passion for justice. We offer our skills. Use our gifts to end violence. We offer our faith, our hope, our love. May our encounters with violence bring us closer to you and to each other. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, who knows the pain of violence. Amen. Thank you. 
Supper, we're reminded that the God we serve is one who loved us so much that he became one with us, experiencing every aspect of humanity as a servant and not a Lord. I'm reading from Isaiah 53. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed 
for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The life and death of Jesus make it clear that the heart of God is with those whose hearts are broken. Would you pray with me? Our Lord and Father, thank you for standing with us in our pain and taking on our suffering by dying on the cross. As we take this bread and this cup, please renew our spirits so we can bear others' burdens as you have borne our own. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please now stand and pray the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is an open table and all are invited to come forward. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up. So there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind. Call me out. You would cross an ocean, so I would interrupt. You've never been closer than you are right now. Jaira, you are enough.
sing this song as we give thanks uh, to these gifts that we are able to give back to God in this place. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jared and Bill and Jesse and Jacob, the four ward men, and Gina Moore this morning. It's always so special to have the ward family leading us in worship. Good morning, 158 Heights members and friends, guests in person and online. Grace and peace to you in abundance. Today I'm going to take a little break from the series in John, as Jarrett mentioned, to talk about uh, the event from this week, the massacre in Uvalde. And our worship focus has been on lament. Lamenting to God when we see evil, uh, calamity, distress, loss, tragedy, uh, pain, grief. I was at a conference from Monday through Wednesday of this week in Austin, Texas, a, a seminar for preachers, and about 35 of us were in the conference room, and about noon on Tuesday, people started getting texts and checking their phones and starting to read the news of what had happened. And as the afternoon went on, the numbers got larger and larger. And our sense of just disbelief got larger and larger. And Many of these preachers were from Central Texas and were very familiar with Uvalde and maybe had relatives there or church members with relatives there. And by the end of the day, there was just a pall hanging over the room, a pall of sadness and shock. And I just thought, I can't just preach the series, I was, the sermon I was planning on in light of this and so I was very grateful to be able to text Jared and say let's shift our focus to lament and talk about this and to be able to be confident in Jared uh, to have the gifts and the thoughtfulness to do that and so thank you Jared. I'm going to read Psalm 42 and 43. These are Psalms of lament. And I've taken the liberty to change the first person singular to the first person plural so that we will feel, you know, included in this prayer as we're meant to. Listen to the word of the Lord. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so our souls long for you, O God. Our souls thirst for God, for the living God. When shall we come and behold the face of God? Our tears have been our food day and night, while people say to us continually, where's your God? These things we remember as we pour out our souls, how we went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, 
a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O our souls, and why are you disquieted within us? Hope in God, for we shall again praise him, our help and our God. Our souls are cast down within us, therefore we remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon. Deep calls to deep as the, at the thunder of your cataracts, all your waves and your billows have gone over us. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with us, a prayer to the God of our lives. We say to God, our rock, why have you forgotten us? Why must we walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses us as with a deadly wound in our bodies our adversaries taunt us while they say to us continually, where's your God? Why are you cast down, O our souls, and why are you disquieted within us? Hope in God, for we shall again praise him, our help and our God. Vindicate us, O God, and defend our cause against an ungodly people. From those who are deceitful and unjust, deliver us. For you are the God in whom we take refuge. Why have you cast us off? Why must we walk about mournfully because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out your light and your truth. Let them lead us. Let them bring us to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then we will go to the altar of God, to God our exceeding joy, and we will praise you with the harp, O God our God. Why are you cast down, O our souls, and why are you disquieted within us? Hope in God, for we shall again praise him, our help and our God. Thanks be to God for his word and for his living word, Jesus Christ. I've seen a social media meme a few times since Tuesday that goes something like this. Thoughts and prayers without action is evil. And you know, I can agree in some sense with that. I'm so tired of the expression thoughts and prayers. It just seems so shallow and superficial and trite. I'm almost expecting a, an emoji just to emerge that symbolizes thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Biblical lament is a form of action. It may not be the only action, but it is a form of action. Biblical lament is taking complaints, anger, confusion, and longing to God. In Psalm 42 and 43, the psalmist says, my soul longs for you. As a deer longs for water, the psalmist is saying, in the same way a deer longs for water, it has to have water to live. My soul longs for your shalom, your presence, peace, justice, rightness in the world. And twice the psalmist mentions that his adversaries say, where's your God? Where is your God? The psalmist says, my soul is cast down, disquieted within me. And this is the same expression Jesus uses in the Garden of Gethsemane. My, my, my soul is disquieted. Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your torrents. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. That's a reference to tumult or adversity or affliction or tragedy of some kind. Did you notice that the psalmist has almost a, a dialogue going uh, as if he's wrestling how to be in the midst of this? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Scholars say that they cannot find a historical context for this psalm. 
if you're able to widen your parameters a little bit from thinking that David wrote every psalm, then you look for a historical context for the psalm somewhere in the history of Israel. And they say they can't find one. And that the, the context of this psalm is whenever and wherever the people of God are crying out to God in distress, longing for his presence, for shalom, for justice, for peace. Friends, this is not thoughts and prayers. Biblical lament is to thoughts and prayers as iron is to tin foil, as steak is to meat product, as a flesh and blood person is to a mannequin. Biblical lament is a kind of action. Here's a couple of sayings that I really like. True lament isn't an expression of weakness or whining or self-pity. It's an authentic expression of faith. There are more psalms of lament than any other kind of psalm. And then this saying, God can handle our broken hearts and our raging words of protest. Ah, the raging words of protest. There are so many emotions that surround what happened on Tuesday in Evaldi. I've put a little schematic of them here. Anger, grief, shame, sadness, numbness, pity, fear, disdain, helplessness, frustration, but at the center of them all seems to be rage. I've only heard one parent express this, but I imagine it's pretty common among the parents of the children who were massacred in 2012 in Sandy Hook. Because you can imagine per that perhaps the only consolation they took from that was to say, this is the inflection point. This is the tipping point. Never again. We're going to do something, something to prevent this so that my child did not die in vain. And yet here it happens again, 10 years later. Virtually the same scenario. A young, troubled man shoots his mother in Sandy Hook, his grandmother in Uvalde, goes to an elementary school and proceeds to massacre children and teachers. 20 children in Sandy Hook, six teachers. I imagine the rage of the parents of the children in Uvalde at having to experience this and seeing this as a, just a sort of increasingly common occurrence. I imagine the feelings of teachers, as Jarrett mentioned, who are burdened with teaching, but now are increasingly burdened with a, a sense of having to protect their children or even securing their own safety. I've thought this week of Jared and David and Earl Snyder and, and Melissa, who just retired from preaching. Forgive me if I've not noted any of you who are teachers. Here's a slide I found. This is, believe it or not, the artist is trying to portray lament that is laced with rage. Why, oh God? Where are you, oh God? And so the question now among people is, what, what is the cause of this? What is the the solution. We must do something. And though this is a not a pretty picture, when I think of this, I think of it as a big slimy hairball full of issues. You can't just find one. Here's a schematic 
of all the things that I understand to be just clotted together in this. Assault weapons, guns. We're hearing a lot of that. That's a common element. Why are they so available? How does this keep happening? Background checks, school security, mental illness, family breakdown, video games, bullying, spiritual emptiness, human depravity, sin, evil. Oh, we got to talk about evil. Why elementary schools? What is it about picking the littlest children to massacre? And so we want a solution. <laughs> oh, man, I wish it were that easy. I read an article that wasn't titled this but said something like, the Uvalde School District tried to do everything right. They had doubled their security budget in recent years, in part to comply with state legislation passed in the wake of a 2018 school shooting in which eight students and two teachers were killed. The district adopted an array of security measures that included its own police force, threat assessment teams at each school, a threat reporting system, social media monitoring software, fences around schools, and a requirement that teachers lock their classroom doors, and yet it happened anyway. A high school dropout with no known criminal history was able to evade a district officer outside Robb Elementary School on Tuesday and enter a back door armed with a rifle he bought when he turned 18. Ansel and I were driving around yesterday doing errands, part of our continuing exciting life. And she would go into the store while I stayed in the car to keep it cool, to keep it cool. And while I was in the car, I was listening to NPR. They had a, just a wonderful array of shows and interviews talking with experts about this whole thing. And because I wasn't listening continually and we weren't out that long, I only heard a few snippets, but I heard about a, a woman who was a, a former NRA executive, and she, she, she left the NRA in 2013 because she felt like it was getting too extreme. And she formed a nonprofit don't quote me on this, but I think the name had something like 97 percent because what I took that to mean is that 97% of people are eager to find sensible solutions to the proliferation of guns and availability of guns and, you know, to be able to respect the Second Amendment but do something. And so 97% of people are willing to come towards the middle to do that, but it's the 3% that are on either end. And this is what she said. She said, the problem is it's hard to raise money from the middle. It's very hard. Most of the money goes to the groups on either end. And then I listened to an interview with a former uh, senior executive of a, gun, of a gun manufacturer. And he said that Part of the problem is, even if you ban assault weapons, uh, you can change a semi-assault weapon to an assault weapon with a $20 item available online. And so you can change it from you know, three rounds at a time to 60 rounds in a few seconds like that, and he said, that's the problem. It's, it's just not that simple. You can't just ban assault weapons because it's so easily, easily surmounted. And then I heard uh, someone who was just saying, we need to re repeal the Second Amendment. We need to repeal the Second Amendment. No guns. And someone mentioned, well, we tried to do that with alcohol at Prohibition. <laughs> 
That didn't really work very well. And so there doesn't seem to be one solution. There's a giant hairball of issues and and we cry out to God and we and we and we want to do something and we should do something and it's always tough our lament says Lord how can you allow this and Lord do something and part of that lament is how can we respond for good and not for evil even now we're hearing stories of grace and faith and hope and love. I heard about a, a man who makes caskets for a living and he, he put together 19 children's caskets and two adult caskets and he raced to Uvalde to donate them in love. Just say, I want to help. I want to, I want to make a gesture of support and encouragement. I, I read recently about a... Uh, a, a man who is a security specialist and he emailed the superintendent of schools in Uvalde he said I just want to stay and guard the school unarmed just stand outside at the front door because my wife and my son are in there and I want to I want to be a protector I want to be a protector and so we see already glimpses of faith hope and love and grace amidst the tragedy Oh, Lord, how can you allow this, Lord, do something? Oh, Lord, how can we respond for good and not evil? I want to close by reading the words of John 16, 33. And this was actually pointed out at the conference. I'd never heard this. Let's see it on the screen. I had not, never heard this. These are Jesus' last public words in John. Because after this, there's the prayer to God that takes all of chapter 17, and then after that, he's arrested. And so these are the last public words. And he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And this word for trouble is a very broad word, flipsis. It's rendered alternately affliction, problem, trouble, persecution. It's very broad. But its, it's origins is in the medical field. It, it refers to something, an outside force, constricting blood supply, like hands around the neck. And Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, if I may. It will seem like the world and its problems and its tragedies and its sadness and, and hardness will have its hands around your neck trying to choke off your life. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Friends, that's our challenge take heart because Jesus has overcome the world to, to ask God how to respond for good and not evil I'm going to pray and I'm going to utilize the words of the psalmist Psalm 43, let's pray together O oh Lord send out your light and your truth O oh God send out your light and your truth among us let them lead us. Let them bring us to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Help us hope in you, our help and our God. And as we sang just a few minutes ago, make beautiful things out of this dust because you, O oh Lord, make beautiful things. In the name of our Lord, our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, and in the love and power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we pray to you, O God. Amen. Let's sing instruments of your peace.
God of help, hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.